I'm Josh Burkus. Um, I'm one of the maintainers for the Electo Project, which you'll be hearing about later on. Uh, I have been an election officer for both Kubernetes and Knative projects. Um, I'm on the Open Source Initiatives Election Tools Committee because we keep switching around how we do elections. And um, a long time ago in my history, I was actually an election reform lobbyist here in California. Um, which will also become relevant later on. Um, and if you want to tweet this, that's me. Um, so if you're in here, hopefully one of these describes you, right? Either you're involved with an open source project, um, you're some kind of a community manager or OSPO person, you're in in general and interested in governance elections in general. Um, what this talk is not about, as you mentioned here, is I am not going to talk about any kind of solution for public elections. Um, uh, although some of the lessons learned um, will apply to public elections. Um, okay, hold on. We're going to see if I can actually get my headset because I'm going to be typing later on. So let's see if we can get the headset on here. Yeah. Um, would be live. And let's get this a little bit away from my face. Okay. Is that good? Awesome. Okay. So this is not going to be about public elections, although some of the lessons learned are applicable to designing public election systems as well. So one of your questions is if you're so I know some of the people who are here from the open source project side. Is anybody here from the sort of open government government side? Or is everybody here an open source project person? Yeah, kind of, okay. Um, so if you're an open source project person, you know that some open source projects have elections, right? A lot of the bigger projects have elections. We have elections in Kubernetes, elections in Knative, Fedora has elections, um, Debian has elections. A lot of open source projects have elections for certain offices within the project. This can be for a steering committee, for a project leader, for a technical oversight committee, um, for a lot of other things where there's going to be a limited number of people who are going to actually have the authority to do something. They want to make it democratic. And if your open source project is part of an open source foundation, that foundation is definitely going to have elections. And this includes foundations like SPI, the GNOME Foundation, Python Foundation, OpenStack. All of these have elections. Um, and so they need to actually run those elections. And for that matter, this is such a common thing that within Tag Contributor Strategy, which is a committee I sit on in the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, we even devised a generic template for steering committee elections for an open source project. Um, uh, and, and by the way, at the end of these slides, the slides are public and online, and at the end of the slides there's a whole page full of links. So if you need the links, you can go ahead and look at my slides online and then you can actually click on them. Um, but even a template, because it's such a commonplace thing to do. So if we're looking at, hey, we're going to have an election in an open source project, what makes elections in an open source project possibly different from other kinds of elections. Um, and there's a set of a few characteristics. Um, we define this. They can share this with their elections, but we actually sort of look at those. Um, open source project elections are going to be online and public, um, uh, at least publicly viewable. Secret ballot, voter authentication, archival records, and preference voting. And let's go over all of these. So first thing is, we have this sort of interesting combination of things where because we have people spread out all over the world in our project and we can't feasibly make them physically come together in order to participate in the election, the election actually needs to be on a public website. But at the same time, we want to restrict voting to legitimate members of the project for however we've defined legitimate members of the project. Sometimes that'll be a certain number of contributions per year. Sometimes that will be uh, some other nomination system. Sometimes that will be, um, you know, having your name in certain files or whatever. But there's going to be something of this is how you're entitled to a ballot. 
and not everybody in the world is, even though everybody in the world can actually see the election happening. Um, the, uh, now, there's a couple of ways to handle this, a few ways to handle this. Um, one of those um, that people kind of tried early on was to just have a standalone application where people registered through the application. Problem was that wasn't really a good solution because it's 100% disconnected from why somebody is legitimately a voter in the first place. And it ends up requiring them to maintain an ID in a completely separate system that's unrelated to the system. They have to have an ID in, in order to contribute to the project. Um, so the standalone app method wasn't really good. And so what we've ended up with is two different systems that get used in different online voting systems. Um, one of those is email, and the other one is OAuth. So a lot of open source projects are email heavy and email centric, particularly older projects, right? Linux kernel, PostgreSQL, um, Debian, uh, Fedora tend to be kind of highly email centric. And as a result, it makes a lot of sense for them to do some form of email back authentication in, for the voting system. Because to be entitled to vote, you have to be on a mailing list in the first place, and therefore your membership in that mailing list is a good way to define whether or not you can vote. Um, now, the problem with that is if, you, if you've ever, how many people have had to send out mass emails to large numbers of people? Right, what's your percentage of like bounces or people not receiving the email? That's a major, it's a major issue in email back systems everywhere. And when it's important that each person, when they're getting their ballot by email, it's kind of a critical fail if it goes into their spam box and they can't find it. Um, OAuth is the alternative to that. And OAuth just means for anybody who doesn't do web dev, OAuth simply means doing authentication against an external system that has an authentication API where the person has some more robust login. And sometimes that OAuth is going to be something belonging to the project, like the Fedora ID authentication. And sometimes it's going to be something external, like GitHub. And where I see this mostly is actually GitHub heavy projects, and they use the GitHub OAuth to do this. Um, and that's nice because somebody else is maintaining the machinery of identity. Um, but the drawback to that is that you need this external provider and you have to sort of maintain code that's compatible with the external provider. Um, and obviously, it has to be an external provider that's appropriate for your project, right? So for Kubernetes, where everybody has to have a login on GitHub to contribute, it makes sense for us to use GitHub OAuth ID. But if your project didn't have anything like that, then this would be problematic. So then the second thing that we need, obviously, is secret ballot. And some people may say, well, it's open source. It's all open. Why can't we all vote in the open? Well, here's the problem. If I'm voting on an open source project, chances are I am friends with every single person who is running. And therefore, I cannot allow them to see who I voted for and who I didn't vote for. And that's true like across the people who are going to be voting in the project. And so we really do need to have some kind of secret ballot. But here's the problem. We're having secret ballot in an election that is being held on a public website. Um, and maybe backed by a public source code repository. So how do we do that? Um, and particularly, we have another problem, right? Which is, usually the people who are administering the voting system are going to be contributors themselves who are also voters. And therefore, they need to not be able to see how other people are voting, even though they may have direct access to, say, the database backing the voting system. Well, this is why we have cryptography. And I'm not talking about blockchain here, <laughs> right? Just forget that entirely. No, I'm talking about just classic secret key cryptography. Nothing particularly special. And by encrypting the, b the connections between voters and ballots using a pass key supplied by the user, we can have public or semi-public systems that nevertheless have secret ballots because you cannot figure who voted for what without either getting a complete copy of the database and doing a whole bunch of number crunching, that's obviously you know, an option, particularly if it's a very small pool of voters, um, or by having the voters' individual pass key that they came up with. Um, I can actually flip over and you can see this. So, T 
do do do. Oh, it's not. Hold on. Mm. Sorry. So this is the Electo system, which is one of the systems we'll be exploring. But you can see right here is that rather than having a norm foreign key link in the database, we have the, the voter ID, which is in instantiation from user and election. And we have the voter ID, and they have a ballot ID that's actually an encrypted string, an encrypted bit key that is made from encrypting um, their um, pat, encrypting their the link to their ballot with their pass key. And then if you actually see the ballot, this links to UUIDs in the ballot. Um, the, um, and that way, even though, like say I'm an election officer, um, actually I'm not, I finally managed to get off of being an election officer, but even though I was an election officer last year for the 2021 Kubernetes Steering Committee elections, even though I had direct access to the database, I still can't tell who's voting for what. And you also use UUIDs here so there's no ordering So, and then one of the other things that I mentioned here might be a surprise to some people, which is preference voting. So we need to talk about preference voting a little bit and why it works better for open source projects. So first let's go over what is preference voting. So regular elections, like what we're used to in the United States for most elections in most places, is what are called plurality or first past the post elections. And that means everybody votes for a candidate and whoever the top voters are, even if they were elected by a minority of voters, win. And one of the things that we've noticed is a problem with plurality elections is it actually gives an advantage to a candidate who has a dedicated minority of the voters over a candidate who is generally liked by a majority of the voters, which then tends to promote extremism among your candidates because it's more important to maintain that dedicated minority following than to be generally acceptable. Um, a preference election has you actually in some way rank the candidates in how each candidate you would prefer to each other candidate. And that tends to result in candidates who are more generally acceptable winning over candidates who are more liked by a dedicated group. So let me actually give you a story um, of why this is something you actually want for your open source project elections. How many people here know what software in the public interest is? So software in the public interest is a 501c3 nonprofit, so charitable nonprofit, um, which hosts financial resources for a bunch of projects, primarily among them Debian. Um, it's also the legal backing for Debian as well. Um, for the other projects to host, it just hosts financial resources for them. And it's been doing this for a long time. And back in 2006, um, we were having a political and operational problem in, with XPI, which was that we had an extreme candidate who was interested in being very disruptive and making political points using his board position on the SPI. And since the SPI's job was really to be the legal and financial backing for open source projects, we actually honestly needed to be as stable and as low key as possible. You want a bunch of boring people on that board because their job is to like not land anybody in court. And this person was, didn't care about that. And the problem is that because he took these extreme positions, he actually had a dedicated popularity among yeah, about a quarter of the followers, particularly people in the Debian project. And so as long as we were doing plurality voting, even though the other three quarters of the voters really disliked him, he was always on the board. Because having 25% of the people vote for him was sufficient to keep him on the board. So in 2006, we switched over to preference voting. Um, and 
as a result, voters were able to rank not only who they liked the best for the board, but also who they liked the least, which makes a difference. And suddenly, we ended up with a board where the people who were the most generally acceptable were the ones who got elected to the board, and the people who caused people to hate them, as well as causing some people to like them, ended up off the board. So, I think you can see why this is a good thing for open source projects, um, uh, particularly for elected positions in open source projects where you're really looking for people who are good stewards rather than people who are necessarily inspirational. The, um, so there's two different kinds of preference election types. One of them is called instant runoff voting. Um, there's a subset of that called single transferable vote. Um, there's a variety of different permutations on this. The other one is called ranked choice voting. And I'll go over both of those. Um, for instant runoff voting, the idea is that you pick a first, second, and maybe third choice. Uh, nobody tends to do that. If they want 10 or 100, they tend to go over to ranked choice. Um, so it's generally first, second, third. Sometimes I've seen fourth on some things, um, but it's rare for instant runoff voting to work together with um, choosing everybody, but not unheard of, because that's how we did the last election in OSI, actually, was instant runoff, but we chose everybody. Um, but usually it's first, second, and third choice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then IRV, then any kind of instant runoff work works through a series of eliminations. Um, and so this is actually a snapshot from the last OSI election, but I can actually show it to you in a lot more detail. And so what happens is you gradually eliminate. Instant runoff algorithms work a variety of ways. This one was actually what's called Scottish IRV. And so with Scottish IRV, first you look for any candidates who already have above a majority threshold of votes. And then anything that they have over that majority are called excess votes, and those get redistributed. And if that pushes anybody over the majority, they're also one of the candidates. And if not, then you eliminate the person who got the least, who got the lowest preference, and redistribute their votes and keep going from there. Scottish is one of the more complicated systems for IRV. Most of the time, you just take the lowest vote getter, redistribute their votes, then keep going up until you've narrowed it down to the number of candidates that you have. So, so if somebody has the lowest number of first place votes, then you eliminate them from the list of candidates, and you look at what their second place votes are. And you take those second place votes, and you redistribute those to the other candidates and then you recalculate who's first, second, third, et cetera. Yes? In what way? How is that any different from a group of people deciding to vote for a particular person in a plurality election? The, um, I mean, that, I was going to say, that's called voting and that's called campaigning, basically. Um, the, um, the one way that political parties have hacked ranked choice voting um, is if it's only one, two, three ranked choice voting, we're only ranking, say, the first three candidates, they'll stuff the ballot with a bunch of likely looking extra candidates in order to prevent the candidates they don't want to win from grabbing those number two and number three spots. That's why three is not enough. That's why you need yeah. hundred. Yep. Um, now, ranked choice is a little bit different um, because, first of all, in ranked choice, you're expected to rank or, for some systems, give no position to every single candidate on the ballot. 
So if there's five candidates in the ballot, you do five. If there's 12 candidates in the ballot, you number them one to 12. Um, depending on the system, you can have some of them have no position. You can have some of them do a tie. Some systems allow this, some don't. Um, and then, but then one of your problems is you say, hey, this is a complicated DAG graph thing of everybody's going to have a different list of the order they prefer them in. How do I compare all these to decide who is the most preferred candidate? And the answer there actually comes to us from the 18th century, the Marquis de Condorcet. So this free thinker, enlightenment thinker in, um, in the 18th century was actually thinking about how do we improve elections to get the most preferred candidate. Um, and he came up with a set of mathematical algorithms to evaluate whether or not the first most preferred candidate was chosen. And we still use these algorithms today. Like literally nobody has been able to improve on this dude's work in terms of the verification portion of this. And so the Condorcet algorithms are basically our test for test-driven development for designing Condorcet compliant voting systems. Um, when, and this is something that confuses people because they say it's a Condorcet election. And saying something like a Condorcet election is saying something like it's, um, uh, it's an IETF certified network protocol, right? As in the Condorcet portion is actually the certification that the election produces the correct result given the correct inputs. The actual code can be a whole bunch of different things. And so what you see are documented is Condorcet methods, and the Condorcet methods are the actual practical algorithms that can be rendered as code in order to produce a Condorcet outcome. Um, most of these use pairwise um, preference comparisons. Some also do um, uh, DAG evaluation, where it says, hey, if I, prefer, if I prefer candidate B to candidate C and candidate C to candidate A, it actually matters the complete chain of those. Other ones don't, they just compare individual pairs. Um, you can actually see this. So for example, this is one of the ways of implementing this is something called a beat matrix, which is you create a two dimensional matrix of which candidate was preferred to which other candidate in numbers, right? And so for example, in here, candidate A was preferred to candidate B by 38 more people than preferred candidate B to candidate A. Um, and this is a little bit easier to picture. And again, this is this 2006 SPI election as a graphical diagram. So you can actually see right here, which is, um, and I was running in this election, which is why I pick it out. Um, the, uh, but like that 17 more people preferred Neil McGovern to Michael Schulstis than the other way around. Um, and that's how you decide, and then you add those mathematically together, you calculate the matrix, and then you decide who won on that basis. There are other mathematical things that can go in there if you're actually writing the code. So let's talk a little bit, having given us our requirements, let's talk a little bit about election software that's available, which is part of this, right? Because there is stuff out there, and there are actually multiple choices now, which is really nice. So for a long time, there was only one choice, uh, which is the first one that I'm going to actually go over. So there's some extra steps we want to look at when we're evaluating election software for our open source projects or similar or open source foundations or similar organizations, right? One is hosting options, as in who's going to host the software. Um, one is which kinds of voting tally they support because some organizations already have pre-decided, hey, we do our elections by Scottish IRB or by the um, Condorcet min-max method or something, and therefore they need voting software that supports that particular kind of tally. And then the third is which authentication options they support, because there's a lot of differentiation there. Um, now, for hosting, um, our basic options here are self-hosted, which probably means that it's going to be open source software that you run and host yourself. Second is free hosting that you don't host yourself, that someone else hosts. 
And then the third is paid hosting that someone else hosts. Um, and there's trade-offs there. It's all available to people, and I'll show it to you. And, and so on that basis, we're going to go once, um, which I think kind of exemplify what's out there. And these are actually the four most popular platforms that I know of, at least within the space of doing elections for open source projects. So our first one here is CIV. And CIV stands for uh, Condorcet International uh, Internet Voting System. It was probably the first practical and widely used Condorcet election system in um, the internet age. It was actually developed at Cornell University more as a demo that Condorcet elections, now that we all had computers, Condorcet elections were not a theoretical thing but could actually be a practical possibility. Um, it's been around since 2003. Um, and it's still, there's still an instance of it hosted at Cornell University that is available for you to use for free. So free hosting at Cornell University, you can use any time, or code is available on GitHub. You can actually run it and self-host if you want to have your own instance. It supports all, it supports at least like eight or nine different known Condorcet methods, including something called proportional Condorcet, where you do a really complicated set of matrices where different groups of votes get calculated in their own matrices and then those matrices get compared. It's complicated, there's a lot of math. I've never had a reason to use proportional Condorcet but there are people who do, and SIDS is the only one I know that offers that as an option. Um, uh, all of SIDS' only authentication option is email authentication versus email tokens. Um, so advantages, disadvantages of using SIDS, one is it's already been localized to five different languages, so that gives you different options for doing it. Disadvantage, it's really old code if you're doing self-hosting. It's an early Perl 5 version. I think it's like Perl 5.4 or 5.5. So you might have difficulty running it and certainly um, might have difficulty hacking it if you need to make changes. Um, I, if you're using the publicly hosted thing, it's being run as a best effort service by Cornell University. So they have not dealt with things like not getting, they're blacklisted by s on several blacklists because people have abused the service to send spam to people, et cetera. Uh, and as a result, um, they will have a very high degree of non-receipt of the emails for voter tokens. I will tell you, having run several elections on SIVs, um, I, if you are an election administrator, a good 40 to 60% of your time will be dealing with email problems. So, say so you don't want to use SIVs for, for those reasons, for email things, what are other options? Well, there's Helios. Um, now, Helios was created by a bunch of open election geeks who were specifically focusing on the issue of end-to-end -end decryption and verifiability for online elections. They were really thinking about building this for public elections. And they wanted to say that, hey, it is possible to make public elections that happen over the web secure. Um, and that's where they put all of their effort into it. Um, it's available. You can either run their code yourself, self-hosted. It's a Django JavaScript application um, that you can run on your own. Or they have an instance of it um, that they run for free and you can use that to run elections. Again, they're running it for free. There's no paid staff. It's best effort. Sometimes it goes down, but you don't pay for it. Um, and you don't have to figure out how to host it. Now, one problem that rules out Helios for me personally is that it does not have support for any preference elections. It is strictly first past the post elections. Um, so if you are not in fact doing preference elections, then Helios is a good option for you. If you are, um, it's not. Um, there are a number of issues open that show how complicated it would be to add preference election capabilities to Helios. There are a couple of forks of it that have preference elections sort of half implemented. Um, the actual project would welcome that. They're just not gonna do the work themselves. So. Helios won't work for you, SIVs won't work for you for other reasons. What else do you have in there? Well, there's actually a whole set of proprietary elections apps that are available on a pay per election or subscription basis, several of which are actually pretty good. Um, the probably most popular one about that, partly because it's the most reasonably priced, is OpaVote. 
Now, OpaVote is a closed source voting system, and it was created. So I mentioned that a number of years ago, I was a lobbyist in Sacramento for verifiable elections, um, which is how we got paper trail on the computer voting machines, is because of that lobbying. Well, one of the other lobbyists who was there with me um, went off and decided to develop um, a voting, use all of their computer engineering stuff that they did as part of the lobbying, and deploy this voting company and make a little bit of money off of it so that they could actually credibly maintain it, and that became OpaVote. Um, only paid hosting, so there's no open source option or self-hosted option here. Um, you pay per election. Um, they support several Condorcet methods and several IRV methods um, for elections, um, and it works through email authentication uh, only. And again, email tokens the same way that we had with Civs. Because it is a paid service with staff that maintain it, their spam blocking problem is a lot less than it is for SIDS. Um, the, one of the advantages is because it is a paid service, um, the documentation and the hosting are relatively high quality. Um, I, it includes one feature that it has that was unique among the systems I surveyed was automated reminders um, to send out to all of the voters. Um, and this open vote is actually localized in four languages. Um, so, so you have multilingual options there. Um, again, none of these systems are designed for public elections, for public government elections. Yeah, but, but none of the systems I'm covering today are designed for, for that scale. Um, the, um, uh, there's a bunch of similar ones to OpaVote. Um, uh, the ones that I, I saw that had good ratings and good reputations were Election Buddy, Election Runner, and Simply Voting. Um, uh, similar value proposition to OpaVote, um, you know, slightly different detailed features like Election Buddy has really nice design features for your actual voting page, which is not something OpaVote bothers with, but it has fewer voting tally options, you know, and, and you just figure out those trade-offs. Um, and all of these are either subscription or pay for election. Now, the last one I'm going to talk about is the one that I worked on myself and still work on myself, which is called Delecto. Um, and uh, I think we will have time for me to go through a demo of Electo. Um, yes, we will. Um, so it's Electo. So Electo was a voting system we specifically designed for Kubernetes and a bunch of other cloud native projects at the Cloud Native Computing Foundation to support their specific election workflow. And their specific election workflow involved being extremely GitOps-centric. Um, I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, and this is now officially a project of TAG contributor strategy within the CNCF. Um, so major eval points, currently only available through self-hosting. It's a very simple application. There's a container image available. It's a Flask app, um, requires a relational database. Um, and you can self-host it. There are no free or paid hosting options that I know of. Somebody, it's Apache license, so somebody could create one, but they haven't, as far as I know. Um, the, um, and the only authentication that it, current, that it supports is some form of OAuth. Um, the only OAuth that's currently implemented is GitHub. Um, there's a very obvious plugin location if anybody wanted to contribute OAuth authentication to other OAuth providers, but nobody has yet. Um, and actually, the OAuth thing is, is a hard thing in the project because one of the reasons the project was developed, we were previously using SIVs, and so one of the requirements of the Electo project was no email. Um, so we're not going to change that. Um, OAuth is using an external authentication provider through their API. So authenticating against something like GitHub or um, Google Docs or um, uh, the Fedora ID or somebody else who provides an authentication API. Now, I mentioned it's GitHub centric. So the idea is that it ties into GitHub or GitLab repository. And instead of using a web UI, all election administration actions are a pull request or a merge against your repository. And the reason why this made sense for these projects is that these projects already have very sophisticated apparatus for 
approval and authority for merging code. And so having an election system that uses that means that how they approve elections is not different from how they approve everything else. Um, uh, it's a very young, small project, right? It's only uh, it's a little over a year old at this point. Um, the advantage of that is the super simple and portable code, very easy to host yourself. Disadvantage, obviously, is it's not very sophisticated, doesn't provide a lot of options. Um, I, one of the features that Electo offers that I realize surveying other things that they other places don't offer is none of the other election systems I look at allow you to have an election administration team. So even OpaVote, which is otherwise very sophisticated, you're expected to have a single election administrator, um, which again was a problem for a lot of open source projects where they want to have an election team of like three or five people so that they have distributed responsibility um, and avoid questions of bias of the individual election admins. Um, so um, I'm going to actually give you a tour of that one um, because that's an easy one to tour. Um, so the, um, this is the Electro interface. So again, like I said, it works via OAuth. So when I'm signing in, I'm signing in against GitHub. And I previously authorized with GitHub that, OA, that this Electo instance, which is just our test instance, is allowed to request my credentials from GitHub. Whoa. <laughs> now that's very interesting. OK, maybe I'm not doing a demo. Yeah. Or maybe it can actually reach GitHub right now for some reason. Yeah. So, OK, maybe I'm not doing a demo. I got zero off. Yep. 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 Oh, there we go. Okay. Now it's having internet problems. Um, I, I am on the conference internet, so. Um, okay. So, um, one of the other ideas of Electo is that these are the auctions for your project, and so it stores them all in perpetuity because we want to have a permanent record of the elections. Um, so this is the current election, but we can actually look at all of the elections that we had previously. These are a bunch of, this is our test instance. So these are a bunch of uh, random elections that we either copied from a real one or generated, you know, as part of our test case. Um, but the one of them that I currently have open right here is um, the original one that we tested the system, which, which was naming the project, because um, we had a number of ideas of names for the project. And the way that you actually vote in that, and so we'll show you here, explore preference voting here, right, which is, um, uh, do, 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 like, maybe I like Ribemont, and there, and then, um, uh, yeah, um, but it tries, because most people don't intentionally do that, um, uh, you know, if you do that, um, that, that's the way that you can do it. Because you are actually allowed, we're using the schultz condorcet method, which does allow ties. So you can actually have two people who are placed number two, and the calculations will go through it. Yeah? It's, yeah, uh, let me finish the demo, um, and then we will field that. Um, the um, uh, okay, so so like I'll do. Here's my set of votes, and then and then I have to create a passkey of at least eight characters. Um, doo -doo -doo. And part of this is that in order to in order to have this actually secret. No one else has that pass key. There's no way for the election administrator to recover it if I decide I want to change my ballot and I've forgotten it. Um, so we go back and it's still open and that sort of thing. Now, if I actually re-enter this, oop, I did not type that correctly. I can actually
Oh, I apparently didn't type it correctly before. <laughs> Go. There we go. Um, and, and I can actually view that, and if I entered my passphrase again, I could revoke my ballot so that, that I could either decide not to vote in the election or I could vote again. And again, this was one of our requirements um, because in a lot of cases, people wanted to vote early in the election to make sure their vote, but then stuff would come out during the election that would cause them to want to change their vote. And if we could technically support that without invalidating voter privacy, we wanted to, and we figured out a way to do it. Um, yeah. The um, okay. So now can't see the results this way. So let us go ahead and do something about seeing the results. Now I said everything is a pull request, right? So this is actually the this is the definition of the election in the test election repository. So what I want to do here is I actually want to go ahead and end the election so that I can actually do the vote tally because until I've ended the election, it will not allow me to do the vote tally. Um, and I'm already defined in GitHub as one of the election administrators, which you can see right here. So this pull request will actually go in. It does not. It does not. So. That's an important thing to keep in mind with changing the start and end things is it does not actually cancel out ballots by date because there are no dates on the ballots. And the reason why there are no dates on the ballots is because we want to make it difficult to snoop via timing attacks. Um, the, um, because that's something somebody could otherwise do over the network. Um, the, um, so, so yes, I can do this because actually my vote was on the 29th and it's going to be part of the tally. So just an important thing to keep in mind that the system will allow me to change the date to a time in the past, but it's not something you would actually want to do during a, a real election. Well, yeah, all they can see is though the ballots are coming in. They can't even know who are, who's casting those ballots. And that's the important part, right? Is they can't know who's casting those ballots. Um, so. Yep. So let's go ahead and commit that. And do do do. So, yep, and it got picked up pretty quickly. It's watching for the stream of changes from GitHub. So it can sometimes take 10 minutes to pick it up. This time it was just really fast. So since I've actually got this, now this results page is actually manually generated by the admin. Um, so it's not actually the real results page right now. Uh, the admin has to manually enter it and actually, and the reason for that is that a lot of projects have rules around how much of the election results they disclose. So this actually gets typed in by the admin. Um, so let's actually look at the real election, right? So we have number of winners. We have four voters. Um, you can download the anonymized ballots as a CSV file for archival purposes. And if you have a voting geek in your project who wants to personally verify that the ballot was correct, um, you can say, here's the CSV, knock yourself out. Uh, but let's just have Electo do it for us. And there we have Electo is the Condorcet winner, and these are our rankings. And, and because we're using, you know, um, you can get ties, and that's been a problem in the past. And, and ties happen when you basically have a cycle, right? Voter 1 likes B and then C. Voter 2 likes C and then B. Um, so that is our basic. Um, and it's actually kind of a good tour. Obviously, you can use one of the other systems. Because the other systems involve more options, they're more complicated than Electo is. Um, the, um, but that gives you an idea of administering a rank choice election system. So concluding for this, 
um, you can and should have online secret ballot elections <coughs> for the offices in your project or foundation. Um, preference elections are preferable. As both open source and proprietary solutions, there's various often hosting options um, that are available to you according to what you need. And then we'll go into questions. <coughs> so, you had a question about ranking. So ask me that question again. Actually, here, wait a minute. Wait a minute, let's get this on tape. Here, you want to hand him the... Uh, Hey. Oh, hey, look at that. Yeah. Um, so as a uh, ex, ex Portland native, I'm super stoked about something called star voting, which was developed there. Um, essentially, it is intended to be a uh, upgrade uh, of like RCV and other IRV based methods. It's score then automatic runoff. So the tabulation is super, super simple. Um, with rank choice, as you alluded to a couple times, it gets kind of hairy depending on whether you want to do the Scottish version or other versions, and it, it's tricky to f kind of go through the math. You have, you have to have an election geek to look at the CSV to verify. Yeah. With, uh, with star, which is another kind of preference <coughs> one, you basically do zero through five stars, just like any kind of product rating system out there. Mm -hmm. And um, it's super simple. The top two scoring candidates are um, go into an instant runoff, and then it goes through every ballot and you know looks at each, ba each person's ballot and says, which of those two t candidates, which ones do you prefer? And that's the winner of the election. Um, I guess my question was, can you include that one too? It's a great, okay, it's a great yeah. voting system. Yeah, um, I didn't actually look at, that's, mm -hmm. that's part of a general class called rating-based voting system. It's, it's scoring, I think. Yeah, scoring, or sorry, well scoring based. Uh, no, you're right, right yeah. it's, it's scoring-based voting system. Yeah. Um, and I didn't include those mostly because I don't know any widely available online software that implements them. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, to, to, to that, I guess there's a really interesting Slack um, plugin called Accord, which mm -hmm. has a whole, it has a, all of them. It has like all kinds of yeah. cool ranking, ranking and rating and approval and IRV and RCV and et cetera. Um, it's, it's really good. So steal their code if it's open source. Okay. Anyhow. Cool. Cool. Where does the encryption between, uh, of the, that foreign key happen? Does that happen in the browser or on the server? That happens on the server. Um, okay, and that's so actually we, one of the big differences you. between, that's one of the big differences between Electo and Helios. Um, Helios because um, solidly trustable voting was, you, basically the sanctity of the voting booth was their primary priority. They do the encryption in the browser. Um, I, it was just easier for us to do the encryption on the server side and, and it wasn't, that wasn't our primary um, wasn't the primary problem we were trying to solve. So presumably, like the election, the yes, administration but if, team. But, is saying, but if the somebody server. submitted a patch to Electo <laughs> that did <laughs> it on the browser, we would probably accept it as long as it was sufficiently wide support for browsers. I mean, that's one of the problems. You look at the yeah, JavaScript yeah. code in Helios, and to support sort of a wide array of browsers, it's pages of code. Speaking of ancient developments, uh, Lewis yeah. Carroll wrote a book called The Calculus of Consent mm -hmm. quite a few years ago. And his point was that designing this kind of a system can determine the result, mm -hmm. just as in your election that you referred to at the beginning yep. of the process, you changed the voting system to change the result. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair thing to try to do? That's a philosophical question. Well, I don't, since it's a philosophical question, I can't get a determinative answer. <laughs> but, you know, in this case, changing the result was a case of the majority, so seven out of the nine board members who were elected by the membership voted to make this change. Um, and these are the ones who were voted, who were elected under the old system. So, um, you know, it's a question of if you believe that the old system was at least somewhat democratic, um, then, then you know, then the change is valid because the elected representatives are are actually making it. Well, all of these systems are yeah. valid in a sense. That's yeah. for sure. If it's yeah, but by the, by choosing one, you're prejudicing yeah. the result in some way, whether right. you understand it or not. Yes, and and in this case, we were consciously prejudicing the result. Yes. 
That was the, that was the entire intention. And more importantly, it did not trigger a mass walkout of the voters, right? The majority of the, the, majority of the registered voters voted in the fo following election. I think this is one of the reasons that some countries have 6,000 6, amendments to their constitutions yeah. because they keep changing their mind. Yeah, just to add on to what Dave was saying, um, when I was a freshman graduate student, uh, I took a course that talked, it was a mathematical psychology, and they talked about, among other things, uh, election systems. And I recall from that, if I remember correctly, uh, that someone named Kenneth Arrow got a Nobel Prize for an analyzing these things and essentially he came up with something which is analogous to the, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the other thing here, but basically he showed that no election system uh, meets all of the requirements. And, and not only that, it's mathematically impossible to have an election system that meets all of the requirements. So if you look at all the things that are obviously good, you can't get it, it's impossible. So that means you have to choose and just get the best you can find. And that depends on your preferences. And so that's kind of sad. And uh, every once in a while something comes up in mathematics and then people commit yeah. suicide because they're really unhappy because they, 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 uh, the theoretical ideal is impossible. Anyhow, that's the thing. I think he, I think he got the, ec the, it may have been in, no in economics or something where the field that gave him the, the Nobel Prize, but it did happen. And as an example of that, one of the reasons is, so like I'm talking about this in the context of elections for open source projects, and one of the reasons why you see IRV a bunch in actual public political elections, but you never see Condorcet, is you can only really get a bunch of computer geeks to trust complicated code algorithms that are going to calculate who won, right? Because the actual Condorcet code is a recursive algorithm um, that operates over the ballot. And I wouldn't even propose that for, say, California elections, simply because I couldn't possibly get the public to trust it, um, even though I feel like it produces better outcomes than IRV does. I just had a, a quick quip about your thing. Yeah, that's Arrow's theorem, which reminds me of, like, the, in the tech world, you know, we have cap, the CAP theorem, right? The, oh, my gosh, my brain just dumped it. Uh, it's uh, Cons consistency, availability, availability and performance. Or, or, partition wait, tolerance. Yeah, is the it's like you can't have all three. It's just not not possible. Yeah. Aero's theorem is really similar. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. To to add a little bit more to that, uh, in the same course, which surprisingly turned out to be kind of important through my whole life because it it affects your 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 mind view, your worldview of things. The other thing has to do with the properties of numbers. Uh, the you know the no, the concept of scaling. And so a nominal scale is, you know, boy, girl, apple, banana, whatever. It's just a name. And then there's the ordinal scale, which is just the order. But it doesn't have a, a it doesn't have a zero. You can't, and, and it's not mathematic. And, and the operations of mathematics uh, are not really defined on the ordinal scale. And a lot of these systems do require the the scaling properties, uh, which which allow you to mathematically and and sensibly do mathematics and do um, you know multiplication and division. If you can't, if, if your data don't support mathematics and your voting system requires mathematics, then you're making a big mistake in using it. And so for that reason, I kind of prefer the ordinal uh, scaled uh, data because it's pretty clear who came in first, second, or third, like horse race data or track, track data. Uh, some of these other systems, and I don't, I haven't looked at this for quite a number of years, like 40, uh, uh, do require the mathematics. Maybe you could comment on 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 the on the on the kinds of scale data that are appropriate for these various uh, systems you've outlined. I'd, I would appreciate the review, but uh, I but I think that's a, a really good reason for using the ordinal data. Well, yeah, you could talk about a metric space for, for various things, but I don't know if you want to. Yeah. The, um, 
So I'm not, I'm not sure that I actually understand the terms scale data and ordinal data in the way that you're using them. Um, well, the thing is, we, we, it's a matter of who's ahead of somebody else, you know that. But if somebody is twice as good or four times as good as somebody, yeah. then that, 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 that's a scale uh, that uh, re so many things require. I mean, the, the next scale up is interval scales, equal intervals. Yeah. Like, for example, uh, Fahrenheit. Yeah, okay, okay, now I get it, yeah, so. Yeah, but the the Condorcet the Condorcet elections just do who's ahead of who, right? I'm not sure because I don't recall. Yeah, no, 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 but I'm saying that's what that's what it is, right? Is is yeah, it's pairwise comparisons. It's who's ahead of who. Um, what he was talking about in terms of the in terms of the scoring elections actually is an attempt to look at who's who is like twice as much as who. Yeah. Um, which is a you know which is a, a different comparison. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. All right, thank you. So I'd like to tap into your lobbying shops for a little bit, if I may, Josh. Okay. So being on Capitol Hill, you've had to convince various people of the efficacy of these voting systems that are alternatives to first past the post. I myself have tried to do the same thing in speeches, in debates, and I continue to run into the problem that there is a learned helplessness when it comes to systems that aren't one person, one vote. That is the common refrain. I'd like to know what you do, what easy things you say to people to convince them to give these other voting systems a try because okay. we know they're more effective. Yeah. Well, so it's a very different – so when I was actually lobbying Sacramento, I was specifically lobbying for the requirement to have a transparent, uh, auditable paper trail for voting systems. Um, not not promoting IRV or anything. Um, the um, we were also trying to get the folks in Sacramento to buy into having the open sy the voting systems be open source, but that was definitely a secondary vote goal because this was back in um, back in the early aughts when we got the Diebold machines that had no paper trail. Um, the I don't remember. I don't remember who the Secretary of State at the time. Um, the um, and the funny, actually, the huge turnaround there, by the way, is the primary people who at the time were lobbying to not have a paper trail was actually the LA Registrar of Voters, and now they're going to be in the talk slot after me talking about how they're open sourcing elections. So halfway, but it's partially open. It is such a 180 degree turnaround. The um, and um, and it's amazing to watch. So. Um, so I wasn't actually trying to convince those other things. And you have here's the big challenge you have when you're talking to politicians, right? Is you are talking to people who were elected under the old system. And therefore, they are going to fear a change in the system because they personally might not get elected again. And so you have to come up with some way where it is to their advantage to change the system. Or alternately, you need to build a coalition of people who are about to term out and say, because if we're talking about public politics, you grab the people who are about to rotate out of Capitol Hill and even put together enough of those, you can often get them to do the right thing even if it's not personally advantageous. Yeah. Um, the, um, um, the, and like I said, you know, the example is I wouldn't even try to convince anybody to use Condorcet or scoring-based elections or anything like that in a public election system right now because they would be afraid of the math, right? Instant runoff voting is something they can understand because you could demonstrate it with a pack of playing cards, which is actually exactly how I would do it, is I would bring a pack of playing cards and demonstrate it, not using a computer at all. Um, the, um, for open source projects, it's a little bit different, right? Because in general, an open source project, you've got a group of engineers, they actually trust the math. And so you just need to show them citations that show that this thing is better. Right? It's with, with, with open source programmers always, if you can show them the numbers, they will often accept it, even if they don't act, even if they haven't actually looked at the code. How would, can't you with a, a deck of cards do fractional um, voting? I mean, demonstrate fractional voting? Because that's the problem I've had, is that you can ex 
pointed to a point when we start talking about the fractional voting, you know, second place vote. If you take all those second place votes and you just hand them out randomly to the various people, then there's a random effect. And what you really want to do is do it fairly. So what you really want to do is take all the second place votes, which will be to different alternative candidates, and then divide them up into pieces and then allocate the pieces. And I don't know how to demonstrate that simply with a deck of cards. So let's put a pin in that conversation for a second. So because we've got to translate, transfer. We have the next speakers coming in in 30 minutes. And that actually is L.A. County is going to be to Josh's point. They are going to be talking about their voting solutions for all people, which is actually what they've been using for the last couple of elections. I have personally helped them design some of the stuff they're doing. So I'm really excited for that talk. So please come back to see that. So let's thank Josh again. Thank you.